Hello there everyone, welcome to the channel if you're new, welcome back if you aren't. I am EDJ, and I am now going to be watching a video about the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, so from Kings and Generals, this is the first Kings and Generals video that I'm reacting to. We just finished the Napoleonic series by Epic History TV, which was marvelous, reacted to all those videos, and before this video comes out, I will have reacted to the H HMS series by Epic History TV, which explains naval, how the, you know, the intricacies and how warships were run by the British, you know, how they were run, how battles were fought, so I feel like it's good that I watched that series before getting into this, reason I chose this video out of the blue is because it's Napoleon related. This month, I called, I dubbed this month Napoleon month on my channel only because I've been reacting to nothing but Napoleon videos this entire month every day. And I decided, hmm, I've already watched everything from Epic History TV. And I'm like, what else can I watch that relates to Napoleon? And then I remembered this battle, which takes place during the Napoleonic era and epic history tv you know mentioned it but there's not a full video dedicated to it so i feel like you know this will be interesting this will be the first video i watch that's related completely to naval warfare and this battle was really important like essentially like long term strategically it benefited the british because napoleon had the ambition of bringing Britain to heel through an invasion, and Spain was his ally during this. And, you know, basically, Nelson and the British, you know, Navy essentially went down and wrecked havoc and won, and kind of ended Napoleon's ambition, which led to Napoleon turning it into an economic war, and then we saw the disaster that came from the continental system. So this was really important in the grand scheme of things, this entire battle. And yes, I know I'm happy with the HMS Victory series from Epic History TV because we kind of learned about the, how the cannons were run, about the flag system, the belts, you know, that were used from the British to run their navy. So I'm hopefully, you know, hopefully that'll be beneficial into this, so I'm not completely blind <laughs> into naval warfare of this era. And yeah, with that said, I think I've gone, I've rambled on long enough. I want to see this now and, you know, really get to experience it with all of you. So, as always, if you look down in the description down below, you will see a link to this video. I always have the links to the original videos in my, in my you know, uh, descriptions. Excuse me. <laughs> and, yeah, with that said, without any further ado, let's get right to it. Let's watch the Battle of Trafalgar from the Napoleonic Wars by Kings and Generals. Napoleon Bonaparte kept the whole of Europe in fear for more than a decade. And although the Napoleonic Wars were predominantly a land conflict, many of his political and military decisions were informed by the dominance of the British fleet at sea, and the naval actions that were fought earlier in the war. Among them was the last great sea battle fought under sail, the Battle of Trafalgar. French victories at Marengo and Hohenlinden in 1800 forced Austria to sue for a separate peace, leaving the United Kingdom as the leading member of the Second Coalition. Napoleon's forces dominated on land, so the only way for the United Kingdom to continue the war was via naval actions. The British Navy was blockading France from receiving foreign goods, and in turn forced Prussia, Russia, Denmark and Sweden to ally against Britain to defend the trading routes. While the Russian Navy was in its winter harbours, the British attacked Copenhagen in 1801 and forced Denmark to leave the alliance. <laughs> I remember, yeah, they made like a league 
I remember this mainly from the oversimplified video. Yeah, they tried to make a league because they were upset at Britain, and then Britain does what it does best and just went to Copenhagen <laughs> and blew it up. Oh man, I still remember a lot from the oversimplified Napoleon series. And yeah, poor Copenhagen, man. When the Russian Tsar Paul I died a month later, his heir, Alexander I, was more lenient towards the United Kingdom, and the anti-British Union ceased to exist. France had its share of problems. One of its colonies, Haiti, had revolted in 1791. Napoleon decided to send an expeditionary force to restore French rule over the island and its lucrative sugar industry in late 1801. The British fleet chased the expedition across the Atlantic Ocean, the island was blockaded and the French received no supplies or reinforcements. It was clear that neither side could strike the final blow, and a peace treaty was signed in March of 1802 at Amiens. The British promised to return the French colonies and leave Malta and Egypt, while Napoleon had to rescind control of Naples and the Papal States. For the first time in a decade, Europe was at peace. Napoleon sent a new expedition to Haiti, but it failed. Holding on to the colonies proved to be extremely difficult, so in April of 1803, the vast territory of Louisiana was sold to the United States. The Haitian expedition and the fact yeah the Louisiana purchase which really helped expand the United States here and um yeah I think a lot of that wealth went into Napoleon's naval ambitions I believe that Napoleon was asserting control over Switzerland was worrisome for the United Kingdom on the other hand the French demands for Britain to leave Malta and Egypt were left unheeded Napoleon started preparing a new force at Boulogne to invade the British Isles, but it was the United Kingdom who declared the war that would be later known as the War of the Third Coalition in May of 1803. Napoleon was not expecting the renewal of hostilities, and his fleet was scattered across various harbours, with 21 ships of the line in Brest, 12 in Toulon, and 9 more in the Atlantic. The superior British Navy blockaded both ports. Napoleon developed a plan in the summer of 1804. One of his fleets needed to break the blockade, move into the open sea, then attack the part of the English Navy blockading another harbour and unite with the portion of the French fleet stationed there. That would have allowed the French to get the army at Boulogne across the English Channel. The situation changed for the better for the French in October, when the British sunk some Spanish vessels. This provoked Spain to declare war on the United Kingdom and ally itself to France in December. Napoleon now had the numbers to implement his plan. In late March of 1805, the French commander at Toulon, Vice Admiral Pierre Villeneuve, ordered his fleet to sail out. He managed to evade the loose blockade set by British commander, Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson. It seems that the British commanders were sure that Napoleon would try to land a force in Italy, so the majority of Nelson's vessels were around Sardinia. However, Villeneuve was implementing Napoleon's plan. He passed the Straits of Gibraltar in early April, was joined by some Spanish ships, and continued towards the Caribbean. Nelson got this intelligence only in late April, and started his pursuit across the Atlantic. The French arrived at the Caribbean Sea Basin in May, and captured a few British outposts. Nelson reached the area in June, but was still one step behind Villeneuve. Despite that, the French weren't able to inflict much damage to the local British colonies, and started moving back to Europe, arriving in the second half of July. A smaller British fleet under Vice Admiral Calder was ordered to stop Villeneuve, but the subsequent battle near Cape Finisterre was indecisive. Still, this encounter prevented the French from reaching Brest to lift the blockade, and they returned to Cadiz. At the same time, Austria and Russia joined the Third Coalition, and Napoleon had to march his army stationed in Boulogne to the east which meant that the invasion of the British Isles was postponed. 
Nelson was appointed the overall commander of the Royal Navy, and as the allied French-Spanish Armada concentrated in Cadiz, he sent the majority of his fleet off the coast of France to block Villeneuve. By the end of September, he joined the fleet personally. Villeneuve received an order from Napoleon to move towards Italy, but ignored it. On the 18th of October, the French commander received a new order to stay in Cadiz and wait for his replacement. Once again, the order was neglected and the Allied fleet went to sea on the 20th. Mm -hmm. Join large-scale battles with military vehicles. The online action game War Thunder has received a major... On the 21st, Villeneuve's navy was getting close to the Straits of Gibraltar. Nelson allowed the French to move as far away from Cadiz as possible to prevent them from retreating. However, by dawn the British vessels were detected. Villeneuve didn't expect Nelson's navy to be so strong, so he ordered his ships back to the harbour. This manoeuvre failed due to lack of training, and the Allied fleet ended up with an incoherent line. The usual tactic of the age was to approach a foe and enter a shooting match, so the fate of the battle was decided by the quality of the ships, crew training and sheer luck. Instead, Nelson divided his fleet into two halves to attack the Allies' broadside. He was personally leading the Northern Group, that had 13 ships of the line, with his flagship Victory in front, while Vice Admiral Collingwood... Yes, we... <laughs> we did a... I... I did a reaction to like Epic History TV's um, HMS victory. It's literally before. It should be before this video, the two videos. So I'm happy to see it. And yeah, this is the battle of Nelson. Essentially, kind of like he's already a force to be reckoned with, as we've seen through like the Egypt campaign, and just like almost like a boogeyman type of figure. He just shows up and like wreaks havoc to the French out of out of nowhere. Like, it's actually kind of frightening him pursuing them, you know? And with the great training of the British, who were essentially the masters of the sea, yeah, just very frightening, man, you know? And, yeah, this is where Nelson dies. I believe, if I'm remembering the oversimplified video correctly, they were here, they were... Like, yeah, not... But they, yeah, the, he mentioned the, the gunfights side to side, but I think Nelson just goes straight through them and wreaks havoc. And I, he dies, but, you know, he essentially, in a way, really helped secure the British power over the ocean, you know? I think that's how oversimplified put it. Which squadron of 14 ships of the line was to the south, led by the flagship Royal Sovereign. By midday, the distance between the two navies was just five kilometers. They were off the coast of Cape Trafalgar, and Nelson issued his famous order. England expects that every man will do his duty. Royal Sovereign was recently repaired and was faster than most ships, so the wind moved it dangerously close to the enemy line, while the other ships in the squadron were lagging behind. At 12.20, Royal Sovereign fired the first volley upon Santa Ana and Forgo, and these vessels shot back. Collingwood's flagship was attacked by four enemy ships. Only 15 minutes later, Belle Isle arrived and covered the right board of Royal Sovereign. More English vessels moved into the fray and tried to cut the Allied line, but Collingwood was outnumbered at the initial point of contact. Still, the positioning of the Allied Navy didn't allow its second-line ships to assist, and by 1400, the majority of the first-line vessels were either sunk or surrendered. To the north, Nelson's squadron got close to the enemy line by 1220, but the wind was calming, and that made Nelson's ships a very slow target. His refusal to fight using traditional line tactics was detrimental at this point of the battle, as none of his ships were able to shoot, while the enemy was sending volley after volley. Despite casualties, the flagship victory was moving forward. Nelson ordered a fake maneuver to make the enemy think that his ships would form up in a line, but instead he then ordered one more turn, and victory ended up between the French flagship Bocanteur and the smaller Redoubtable. This allowed Nelson's ship to use the guns on both sides. The French ships needed to turn, and Victory used that to take Bocanteur out of the game. 
however, victory itself was taking massive damage from Redoubtable. The French ship was also using sharpshooters, and at 1315, one of their shots wounded Nelson. It was clear that this wound was deadly. Redoubtable's crew attempted to board Victory, but the British managed to stop them. Victory was soon reinforced by Temeraire, which moved across Redoubtable's left board and started shooting. And by 1420, Redoubtable was captured by the crew of Temeraire. To the north, British Neptune entered into a battle with Spanish Santisima Trinidad and managed to take it out of the fight. By 1400, it Dang, dude, it, it's, like I said, I've never really looked up, like, for those of you who are new to this channel, most of my interest with, like, famous historical battles, always, I've always only been interested in, like, land battles, you know, from the exploits of Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Hannibal, and, you know, even Napoleon, but, like I said, I've neglected air warfare, like, how war was fought with planes, I've never research that and also navy so you know this is really interesting to me and i really like this and yeah i really like seeing the the british in action you know in a sense you're seeing what makes them like you know i've always heard yeah britannia was the master of the sea ruler of the waves but it is cool to just see it because man they are doing they are bodying <laughs> you know the french and spanish like Dang. It was becoming clear for Villeneuve that he was losing the battle, and he ordered the northern portion of his line to move to the southwest and collapse on the British fleet. However, the captains of these ships failed to see the signal, and this became the final mistake of the Allied fleet. Villeneuve's book enter was in no shape to continue fighting, and soon he surrendered. By the time the remaining 10 Allied ships started their move to assist, most of the vessels in the centre were either sunk or captured. Collingwood took overall command of the British Navy and ordered Nelson's squadron to intercept the French reinforcements. The remaining Allied ships decided to retreat. It was a complete victory, with the British capturing 18 enemy ships. Nelson wow. passed away as soon as he heard the news of the victory. The French defeat at Trafalgar confirmed the naval dominance of the United Kingdom and meant that Napoleon would not be able to invade Britain. But while the battle was raging at sea, the Emperor's Grand Army was moving into Germany against the Allied Austrian and Russian armies. Thank you for watching our video on the Battle of Trafalgar. The second video in this series that will cover the Battle of Austerlitz will be released in two weeks. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters who make the creation of these videos possible. So I think that's it. And yeah, this was my, yeah, this is the first Kings and Generals video I've ever seen and I really liked it. And yeah, I really liked just seeing the, you know, the the well-oiled machine that was the British Navy and just how well trained and like yeah this I think what's really interesting about this battle is that like Nelson definitely took a very different approach than I think like I think he mentioned like it wasn't the the usual way of doing things I guess it's just squaring up and just you know firing but yeah Nelson's maneuvering and just what he did very genius man like he he essentially like helped secure the you know the british control of the sea and really put a hamper on napoleon's ambitions on ever you know invading mainland you know britain and i just have to say that was really awesome like i, I really like that and i'm happy i saw the hms victory series so i understand what what the heck they were talking about when they were talking about the flag signals you know that they used and this was just really cool i really like this and i think i might in the future definitely look up more naval conflict you know start to really you know get my head into that and start learning more about that expanding you know my knowledge on that area that I've neglected my entire life. <laughs> so, 
yeah guys that's a really all that's about it i'm really happy about this very important battle the overall napoleonic wars and i'm happy that you know got a, a more in-depth look on the build-up and just how it was fought so overall awesome and i'll see you all next time bye everyone